Soon after uh, the election, there was this very, very strange incident um, at the annual meeting of the National Policy Institute, the NPI, and that's a very innocuous name for an organization that many people believe is um, sort of, you know, if not, if not, you know, white, you know, nationalist, very, very, you know, far right. And uh, at it, its head at the time was Richard Spencer. He's also the fellow who founded the alternative right and uh, was a Trump supporter at the time and, all, and so on and so on. Now, what was strange about this meeting was that at the beginning of it, Spencer, who was very excited about Trump's victory, sort of started the meeting by addressing the crowd and said, hail Trump, you know, hail our hero, you know, hail our victory. We made this happen. We dreamed Trump into the White House or something along these lines. Now, that, the, the video from that meeting, that turned up on all, you know, all the regular press around the world and all that. But there's a fellow named Harvey Bishop who is a New Thought blogger. Now, New Thought is a name for a generic kind of philosophy called mental science, positive thinking. Um, the most simple way to think of it is that you know, thoughts are causative. Or, 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 as I said earlier, somehow <laughs> what's inside our head, unlike Vegas, what's in the mind does, doesn't always stay there. What happens in the mind doesn't always stay there. So new thought philosophy is that you can create your own reality. We create our own reality. Thoughts are causative. We, we project out into the world the kind of reality that, that we want. Which is kind of magic. Yeah, it absolutely is magic. And we do this unconsciously. It's magic when you, you know you're doing it. And you, you, can, you can kind of do it at will, I guess. Um, and so Bishop, who you know, writes about new thought, all the stuff about we made this happen, we dream this into reality, that sounded a lot like the kind of things that people who practice mental science and new thought do. Trump himself is a devotee of new thought. You know, he's a, a follower of Norman Vincent Peale, uh, 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 author of The Power of Positive Thinking. He went to his sermons when he was a boy. He went there um, uh, so as a man. Trump is using magic. Trump, Trump, well, I'm saying, what, I say whether he's using magic, but he certainly is a devotee of positive thinking. Positive thinking has its roots in new thought. New thought has its roots in 19th century occultism. Yeah. And that's one side of it. The other side is the chaos magic side, which I say in the book that he probably has never heard of it, but he seems to do it naturally. He seems to have a natural sort of talent for the, the ways in which chaos magicians are said to operate. You know, this, the glamour, creating chaos, moving in and out of realities, adopting truth and falsehood as just beliefs that you have temporarily and you dismiss them and you no longer do. But just the, the one thing that really sort of sold me on there being kind of a, a similar morphology, let's say, between New Thought, which generally seems kind of innocuous. I mean, Norman Vincent Peale, you know, he's very sober, you know, conservative uh, reverend. And the chaos magic tends to be a bit more wild and punky and, 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 and dangerous. But they're both results driven. They're both very specific about, it's not about, you know, a mystical experience. It's not about, you know, finding your higher self. It's about having some effect in the real world. And, and they're very specific about it. And, and again, it's not just, it's not like expect a miracle. It's like you have to focus on something that's doable and just needs a little, a little bit more of a nudge. And you're saying, you know, Trump's victory was just the teetered here and there. So if, I'm saying if, if you allow for the possibility of, in some way, the mind, the group mind, in some way being to affect things, then, well, just in chaos theory, you know, uh, sensitivity to initial conditions. You know, a little butterfly flapping over here makes something over there. So who knows? If, a nudge of some way, and this is a word that they use in chaos magic, you, you nudge it in a certain way, give it a spin, and then it, it comes to the, uh, the result that you, that, you, that you want. But in the long run, the idea was that somehow the people on the alt-right had used the internet as a way to propagate, um, well, memes, you know, Richard Dawkins' term for this kind of cultural gene kind of thing. So we, that happens anyway without magic. But they were using one meme in particular, which was of this cartoon character known, Pe known as Peppy the Frog, who was a very harmless amphibian who got drawn into this, um, as a, what they called a sigil. And the sigil is a kind of symbol uh, or image that contains you know, magical powers, magical energies, the, the, the magician's intention, his will, and his imagination. And traditionally, you, make, you, know, you draw one, you make one, you know, that kind of thing. But what's called meme magic is an offshoot of something called chaos magic. And 
to, you can understand chaos magic um, by thinking of it as something like found art. You know, there's traditional art where the painter paints something and works on it. So it's and the idea that this becomes a focus for intention. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So the internet becomes this kind of the, the realm in which the magic takes place. And long story short, what, what people start, how this became something that people were aware of was that people were posting all this stuff and they started to see these strange coincidences between what they were posting and stuff happening in the real world. And this got coined synchro mysticism, which is a kind of techno update to Jung's a notion of synchronicity, which is when there's something, something taking place in the inner world and something in the outer world, and they're absolutely connected in some indubitable, meaningful way, but there's no causal connection. You know, there's no, there's no way that one or the other is linked in the usual ways, and that's why he calls it meaningful coincidence. So this meme magic, uh, rather than have our traditional imagination inside our heads, you have the internet out there. So the internet is a kind of externalized imagination. And, and it makes sense because more and more our, own, our regular world is in this kind of strange interface between its representation electronically and the real world and we want more and more our electronic representation of the world to be more lifelike so everything's HD, everything's you know, Blu-ray, whatever it is, more and more stuff like that. So again, as I said earlier, there's this kind of interchange going on between reality and its, its representation. So it makes sense in some way that stuff happening on the internet would find an echo out in the world. So that's kind of the theory behind it. And when people noticed that this was happening, they said, okay, well, can we make it happen on purpose? I mean, you're not saying that one group of people got together and did it, but it was almost like self-generated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was some, I'm assuming that some people started it, but then when you launch these things, they get picked up out there, and you know, there was a, a basically, I'm not saying every person who did it was consciously saying, you know, okay, we're gonna do this, but some people were. Some people were posting things, saying, hey, look, what, one of the things that happened, they would post things on, on these sites, and the, you're anonymous when you post them, but you get a number, there's an eight, eight digit number is assigned to your post, and people kept seeing when they posted stuff about Pepe, posted stuff about Trump, um, there would be, you know, duplicates or triplicates or four of the same number. So it seems some kind of approval. It's somehow, you know, do more of that. You know, <laughs> and they were betting, which, were they going to get a dub? Were they going to get a, a trip? You know, all this kind of thing. So there seemed to be some kind of response, you know, from, from the medium, the media that they're, they were using. So there was a kind of chaos magic going on. The, the, there's a couple of interesting things here. One, the, the narrowness of Trump's victory. Mm -hmm. The the condition like it was a it was an incredibly narrow victory. It was yeah. almost like a you could see it as a kind of reverse miracle. If if you yeah, didn't yeah. if you didn't want him to be elected, you could yeah. see it as a reverse miracle. Yeah, yeah. There was yeah. some kind of inevitability to it that, yeah. despite the fact he got three million less votes, he was yeah. elected. But also, I don't know if you've seen Jordan Peterson talking about the frog symbolism uh, and I how and how you have or haven't. I haven't. So he. He says this was the most intense synchronicity he ever, he ever saw as he started becoming aware of what the frog represented. So the frog, the frog is between categories. Yes. So symbolically, it, it's between categories. Yes. And also symbolically, the frog was the, the deity of Kek. Yes, yes, the god of Kek. Well, that's the other thing. All these strange, yeah. weird coincidences. Is the yeah. ancient Egyptian god of Kek is a frog. And what's Kek the god of? Chaos. Yeah. And what's the one word that you would characterize Trump's, you know, MO? Chaos. Yeah. So, hey, it all seems to make sense. Because certainly within the circles surrounding Trump, like mm -hmm. Steve Bannon, for example, oh, talks yeah. about Julius Evola. And yes, yes. So, so there's certainly an awareness and affinity for the yes. occult within, the, within yes. that world. That was the other thing that um, sent me thinking, like, yes, something. Just trip. let's, for the people watching, who's yeah. Julius Evola well, I mean, and why is that well, significant? In, in, in February 2017, um, Steve Bannon, who was still on Trump's bench then, he gave a, a speech to what's known as the Human Dignity Institute. And this is, comp this is made up of uh, very conservative churchmen in, in the Vatican. Uh, Bannon was in LA, talked to them via Skype. But what the New York Times hit on in this speech, which is, had all the usual global teapot uh, uh, global Tea Party uh, sort of thing in it, was that, as, as you say, uh, Bannon name-checked Julius Evola. Now, if you know who Julius Evola is, you know that he was a 20th century esoteric thinker who had very far-right political views. Uh, he's brilliant, very controversial, um, 
he was called the dangerous author by the, the German novelist Hermann Hesse. And um, Evola um, tried to ingratiate himself first with uh, Mussolini and then with the uh, National Socialists. He had, he, he had a bit of influence on Mussolini, but in the end he gave up on the Italians and he gave up on Mussolini uh, because they weren't fascist enough for him. He had this vision of a kind of absolute fascism, this kind of theocratic kind of state. Um, and then he tried to get his ideas across to uh, you know, people um, close to Hitler, but uh, in the long run they, they, they didn't adopt him. And then um, after the war, he was this kind of um, uh, fat, shadowy figure in the background, uh, the, the, the kind of the intellectual um, providing so material. He talks about magic and oh yeah, he does, he does, yeah, he does. I'm saying he talks precisely about the kind of um, using the mind to create reality. Um, but I'm saying, and so, so he died again, like Gabzo, he died in the early 70s. So the idea, I mean, what we're saying is the, the idea of that this was consciously created by a certain number of people is not is not. Absurd, it's, even it's, knowing it, what we well, know. I mean, it's, it's not absurd, it's not inconceivable. Um, I, I, I just say, like, I, I'm just sort of saying, I'm not saying they did this, I'm saying it looks like all this is possible and everything is kind of lined up. And, well, in the long run, yes, I, I, I do say it's, it's not inconceivable because I personally accept the reality of synchronicities. I've had too many of them to dismiss them and a few other sorts of things. And, okay, if, 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 and I would say my definition of magic is induced synchronicity. They happen, can you make them happen? And I, I would say that's what the new thought, that's what chaos magic tries to do. So that to me is the, is the crux. Not that they happen, they do happen. Can you make them happen? Um, but no, uh, uh, Evola, um, as I said, in, in, uh, up until his death in the 70s after World War II, he was this kind of intellectual figure um, you know, doing the philosophy for a variety of different far-right groups that were you know, rising up out of the rubble. But in the 20s, um, he contributed a series of articles to an uh, esoteric journal, and they're all about being able to focus the mind intently on your goal, and, and, and he talks about the absolute individual. And again, it's this idea that at some fundamental level of our being, you know, before you are you, your personality, and you, know, you, you do what you do, you live where you live, it's some very, very basic bedrock level of being. You know, it's the general mystical idea that we're somehow we are the ultimate reality already. You know, we, we don't know it, we've forgotten it. But if you can get down to that level, then you can na narrow and, and focus your intent enough to be able to affect reality. At the time in the 20s when Evola was doing this and he was doing rituals and, and different um, practices, what he wanted to do, the reality he wanted to affect was Mussolini's fascists. He wanted to sort of imbue them with the ancient Roman virtues. And I, I don't know how successful he was, but this is what he was trying to do. So even then, you have Evola, who was informing Steve Bannon. He's also a big name for all the alt-right people. He's one of the top kind of intellectual figures that they name check to show that they're more sophisticated than the earlier kind of skinheads. And Evola is also top of the reading list for this fellow named Alexander Dugan, who um, in different ways, he has and had Putin's he, brain, I think. Yeah, well, he's again, depending who you're talking to. Oh, no, 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 Putin never heard of me. Oh, yes, uh, I saw him the other day. It'll, you know, at different times, Dugan himself has, has said contrary things about his how much influence or contact he's had. But again, if, if you know what Dugan is interested in, and he's interested in some very odd things, and if you follow Putin's speeches and actually what, what he's done in the world, you can see where, if not everything, certainly some areas where. Dugan's ideas, have, uh, which again, go back to people like Evola and Chaos Magic, and a variety of different fascist totalitarian kind of ideas. He, he, he does this kind of Lego uh, game with ideologies where he takes, he takes the good bits, let's say from National Socialism or Fascism or Stalinism and kind of puts them together and, and it, there's something he calls the fourth political theory, which um, he's working on creating, it, it hasn't arrived yet, but it's something, it's a work in progress, but it's something to replace the global, you know, liberal, liberalism that's come upon us and Francis Fukuyama uh, pointed to as showing the end of history back in the early 90s. I mean, that, that, that vision nauseates Dugan and, you know, it doesn't go down that well with Putin either because he's talking about... It's kind of a return to blood and soil for them, I guess, is it? I'm sorry? It's more of a return to, like, blood and soil. Yes, yeah, well, well I mean, it, yeah, yeah, well, it's the whole, yes, it's the whole idea. It's, it's nationalistic, but it's the whole... Well, the, the idea that the end of history arrived when, you know, 
free market values and liberal democracy have spread around the whole world. I mean, for some people, yes, clap hands. Other people, like Dugan and others, they saw this as no, they saw this as the world being just turned into a marketplace you know, for them. Uh, you know, globalization for them is basically meaning that you know, wherever the US or the Western, the Western powers go and liberate people, it's basically to open up a new market. And you know, we have to say, there's, you know, there's a lot to be said um, for, that, for that point of view. But his alternative to that is this kind of theocratic, uh, he talks about having, seeing a, a fascist state from Vladivostok to Dublin. Um, and he talks about something called Eurasia. And Eurasia is the idea that Russia is not a backward cousin of Europe, who's never quite catching up to European Western ways. It's a completely new civilization of its own. It has different roots, different influences, different aims, different values. Um, and he talks about it rather than this linear idea of history of being, you know, there's a beginning and you know, it's just cumulative. It's more like there's individual cultures. It goes back to a German historian named Oswald Spengler, who wrote a book called The Decline of the West, incidentally. But he talked about rather than civilizations or history being this linear thing with one civilization growing on top of the other, they're, they're all self-enclosed and they have their own values. So that there's not one mathematics, there's, you know, Persian mathematics, and there's, there, he talks about these, this Faustian culture. In any case, that's the idea. And again, that's very much along the lines, not only in the right, not only the sort of thing Dugan's interested, but also in the left. The whole idea that, you know, oh, there isn't one oppressive truth. You know, um, there's lots of different truths. Anything goes, you know, and it's all socially constructed. Well, that's just trickle down Spengler. Because Spengler's saying, you know, there isn't one. Civilizations are like flowers. They're in the same garden, but they're not the same flower, and they're not all working to get to one big flower at the end. Each one grows, matures, blooms, and dies. What impact did it have on you, or how exciting was it to, to discover that this, this stuff that you've been interested in for so long was suddenly showing up in all of these crazy ways, facilitated by the internet as this kind of... I mean, I, I've thought for a while the internet is, is, is kind of a... It's, it's, by democratizing information, it's kind of allowing all of this stuff to bubble up from the, from the cracks in our culture. And in a way, that would make perfect sense why magic, the occult, positive thinking is now coming up and mm. is, is changing politics and changing culture at the sort of highest levels. Yes. Well, I, I, it's, it's exciting. Oh, I said, I, I woke up, when I woke up, when I saw that the New York Times had, had named checked Julius Evola, I thought, well, you know, things have changed now. Mm. And the, the New York Times' first place to mentioned Julie Settle was something, but then for them to mention it in the context of, at the time, someone who was a close advisor to Trump giving a talk to people in the Vatican. And then even within that, the context where he refers to Evola is in reference to Putin and in reference to this fellow Dugan who's around Putin. I just felt, wow, you know, all the stuff that's on the fringe and on the margins has come into the center. And that, again, confirmed for me the idea that reality had changed, something had changed. Again, it's not, <clears throat> we still have three dimensions, you know, there's still the past, present, and future, but how we understand these things, how we understand what it means to be human, how we understand freedom, all, all these, you know, very important things, how we even communicate. It's very difficult to talk about things. I mean, I, I, one of the things in this article I wrote about uh, Peterson was that, um, and I say it in the book, is that <clears throat> you had this strange thing happening where, um, you know, liberal left students were shouting down professors or people giving a talk or a lecture and they were saying things you know, they didn't like. Okay, you can disagree, that's fine. But what is the difference between you shouting pr professors down now and Nazi youth shouting down Jewish professors in, you know, in, in the 30s? Because, you know, yes, by all means, students can protest, but all student protests aren't about sweetness and light. You know, they're, 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 and, 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 you know, God, you know, if you go back even earlier, you know, the, 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 the University students in Germany in the 19th century were incredibly nationalist. And so their protests were all about nationalism. They were burning foreign books and things like that. So um, it struck me, as I said, we're just, it, it, it's exciting. But then at the same time, I don't know if people are prepared to actually understand what it means. I mean, I've, I worked really hard at trying to communicate these esoteric hermetic ideas in a language, in a context that you don't have to agree with them, but at least they make sense. And I can show that they're not that far away from many concerns of the mainstream uh, philosophical so is tradition. It, is it exciting or terrifying? Well, it's, it's that thing that's both. You know, it's, you're sort of on the edge, and there's no guarantee where it's going to go. And that's what all these people say. It's up to you. 
it's, it's, it's not an automatic process. It isn't the class war, you know, like, oh, the, the march of history will just, if you just let history do itself, it'll take, it'll take the line of least resistance. So if you don't like what's happening, will you have to use magic yourself to kind of try and change it? I think at all times it's very good to be aware of what's going on inside your head. I think that's, that's the key. Uh, and if, if you don't have things going on there, then other things will be, will be in there. Because I said, what happens in the mind doesn't necessarily always stay there, but it might, what happens in somebody else's mind might, might wind up in, inside yours too. So um, the whole idea of wakefulness, attention, all these things which have a kind of cliche, banal character to them now, but they're actually, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're real. And again, it doesn't mean, you know, shouting down Trump or doing anti-Trump stuff or something. It just means being very, very aware and awake. Because I think in these times when it's very, it, it is sensitivity to initial conditions. A little thing can, can, can make something happen. So are we back in the time of magic? I, I, I don't think we ever left it. I think it's more out in the open now. Uh, and as I say, we're not really prepared to how, how should we say, we can dismiss it. We can say, oh, those guys are you know, doing these, whatever it is. Uh, and be critical about it, but we're not really prepared how to deal with it positively. And, and I don't mean in the sense of everybody going out and, and you know, start casting spells or reading tarot cards, in the sense of accepting, well, what does it mean if, it's not, if it isn't just all this superstition everyone's told us? I mean, one of the things I, I, I like to think of it as, uh, there was a time when you couldn't talk about sex without it, I, I, you just couldn't talk about it, or you couldn't talk it without it being nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, slightly titillating you know, kind of thing. But now we can talk about it. We can talk about it in God in all, all different kinds of ways, very clinically, um, very frank and straightforward. It makes it absolutely uninteresting in many ways. But we still can't talk about the occult or magic in that way. You still get the X-Files you know, soundtrack comes on in the background and the woo-woo feeling comes up. And it, I don't want to lose that entirely, just like you don't want to lose you know, the allure of sex, but you also want to be able to talk about it out in the open, to open it up, you know, to make it to make because it more. Because those real. who, yeah, otherwise you're a victim of people who are. Well, other people are going to do it, you know. If 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 you're not, if reality's up for grabs, then get your skates on. Because if you're not going to do it, then other people are going to, and you'll be stuck with the reality that's there. And again, I don't mean sitting at home and you know visualizing your reality. Just just being aware that these things work. Consciousness is something that's. It doesn't just, it's not just there. It's, it's not like ring fenced and protected. It's, it's part of a continuum of other things. And things can get in without you even consciously knowing it. I mean, they, they, this is one of the things Gebser felt when uh, in Germany in the 20s, because he was around some of the early Nazi rallies. And, he's, and this is why he talks about that, the, those group rallies precisely as the, an expression of the magical structure of consciousness. And one of, the, one of the characteristics of that is this kind of continuum a visceral continuum. It's not rational. It, it operates below, below the rational mind. And he talks about how when he went to these rallies, it, even though he resisted it, he could feel, he could feel the kind of energy, whatever you want to call it, coming into him. And not only occultists, but people in you know, uh, science, people like Rupert Sheldrake and people like that. They they talk about something that's along those lines. So um, I think these things are true. I, I, I think we just need to be. We, we need to stay awake, basically.